So I'm Nancy Seymour. I'm the head of the Ozone Protection Program section at Environment and Climate Change Canada. My group is responsible for uh, not only the legislation on the, the chemicals, the CFCs, the HFCs, um, the HCFCs, but also for negotiations under the Montreal Protocol. Can you use a mic, please? Is that better? Yeah. Oh, it's on. Yeah. Is it on? Oh, there we go. That's the light. <laughs> Prisoners would take one. Thanks, you may work. The PhD in electrical engineering. <laughs> if anybody could fix it, we can. Great, thank that you. Better? Perfect. Thanks. There you go. <laughs> So um, the purpose of my presentation is to provide you with an overview of what the Government of Canada uh, is doing to phase down HFCs, how we're doing it, and the status of the regulatory measures that we're developing. So as Tom explained, um, HFCs are used in refrigeration and air conditioning, but they're also used as a blowing agent for insulating foam. They're also used in fire extinguishing as a propellant in aerosols. Um, they're used the, as the infographic um, that we've developed will show it's they're used all over um, your house, whether you, you know it or not. And as, as Tom also said, they're a potent greenhouse gas. Um, they have a, a global warming potential hundreds to thousands of times of that of carbon dioxide. They were developed, HFCs were developed to replace CFCs and HCFCs that were not being phased down under the Montreal Protocol, but that were being phased out. So CFCs have been phased out, and HCFCs are being phased out. The phase out of HCFCs in developed countries is well underway. Uh, the reduction is at well over 90% in, in developed countries, and the phase out is beginning in developing countries. So as Tom mentioned, in uh, 2016, after seven long years of negotiations, the parties of <coughs> the Montreal Protocol uh, adopted a phase down of the production and consumption of HFCs, and this was called the Kigali Amendment. And I think it's important to note here that the, the phase down is not uh, a stoppage in use of the HFCs, it's, it's Consumption is defined as um, the import plus manufacture minus export. So we're phasing down the import of the substances. And the, the, sub, and the import of the substances in bulk. So not, not the substances coming in in equipment, but the substances coming in in bulk. Uh, now parties, um, as of October 2016, will start to, to implement their obligations under the the Montreal Protocol, so in addition to phasing down the chemicals, so gradually reduction, reducing the import, um, we have a licensing, a, a permitting system, a reporting system on, on our imports. Um, <coughs> there's also some funding obligations. The, the phase down will also contribute to um, meeting Canada's obligations under the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change and our Paris Agreement. So irrespective of the fact that we adopted the uh, Kigali Amendment last October, there are several countries or regions that had already started implementing and developing measures to reduce HFCs. So the European Union started with their F-gas regulations a couple of years ago. The United States had started um, with some measures on, on specific end uses. Japan has a suite of regulations and Australia has already, um, is in the process of proposing some legislation. So in Canada, in, 2000, in December of 2014, Environment and Climate Change Canada published a notice of intent to regulate HFCs. So this was well before the adoption of the, of the Kigali Amendment. And that kicked off the process, the consultation process, with um, industry and, and, and um, stakeholders. Uh, we, we consulted intensively throughout 2015 and 2016. And just this past November, we proposed measures, regulatory measures, in the Canada Gazette Part 1. 
And now that publication is a proposal. It was followed by a 75 day comment period. And we received a number of comments. We're in the process of going um, through them now. The measures that we propose on HFCs are being done in the same legislation that um, we use to control or to, to phase out CFCs and HCFCs. We align to the extent possible with the US measures uh, because we have heard and we do realize that trade with, with the US and, and these equipment is very important. The, the final measures are expected to be published um, probably mid-October, mid to the end of October of 2017. Um, that's very quick for us in Environment and Climate Change Canada. This is a government priority. Um, but I'll, I'll speak to the timelines a little bit, uh, a little bit later. So now our objectives of the regulatory uh, measures were one, were to implement our obligations under the Montreal Protocol to phase down um, the, sub, the, the HFCs. They are also to um, implement uh, other obligations, such as licensing and reporting. To avoid future emissions of HFCs, the Montreal Protocol, um, whatever doesn't come into the country can't be emitted. So it's a, it's a front end of the life cycle approach. Um, to limit growth, because HFCs are growing in Canada and elsewhere. And, put, and it also puts Canada in a position to ratify the Kigali Amendment. We, um, our legislation in Canada requires us to have the regulatory measures in place in our domestic legislation before we can ratify and, and um, trigger international obligations. So there's two components um, to our regulatory approach. There's product specific controls and the phase down. The product specific controls establish prohibitions on the import and manufacture of certain products or systems that contain or are designed to contain HFCs, whereas the phase down gradually reduces consumption, in this case import, there's no manufacture of HFCs in Canada, from a calculated baseline over 20 years. The calculated baseline was established in the Kigali Amendment, um, and we have a certain reduction schedule to, uh, to adhere to. So I think this is probably of specific interest to this group, the, the product specific controls. There are four sectors that are being targeted, um, aerosol products, foam products, refrigeration and air conditioning system, and mobile air conditioning. And as I, I said before, it, it prohibits the import and manufacture of products or systems that des are designed to contain or contain HFCs with uh, global warming potential greater than the designated limit, or a blend of HFCs where the blend has a GWP greater than the specific limit. So here's the summary of um, the product specific controls. So you'll see from um, the, I think the fourth down to all the way to the bottom, that's the, the stationary um, refrigeration. And we didn't, other than chillers, we didn't target any air conditioning. Um, we heard from industry that we're not quite there yet. The alternatives might not yet be available, and it's difficult to predict when they would be available. What's the GWP? The global warming potential. Maybe. Oh, yes, compared to carbon dioxide. Compared to carbon dioxide, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So we try to align um, these measures with the measures taken by the U.S. Uh, to the extent that we could. The U.S. legislation is quite different um, in that they have, um, they, they prohibit very specific HFCs in very specific end uses. Um, we didn't necessarily feel, the way our legislative process is, it's quite lengthy, so we didn't necessarily feel that was the best approach for us. It's not an approach that we've taken in the past. Um, the U.S. does have a, a different uh, enabling authority, so we, we approached it more, more globally with a setting a GWP limit um, and a proposed timeline. So our controls are specific um, to the HFC refrigerant or the refrigerant blend, and that's to the GWP limit that was in the previous table. But I think what's What's important to note here is that it, this does not; these controls do not uh, prevent the use and sale of refrigeration or air conditioning systems or equipment 
that were manufactured or imported before the date of prohibition. So you can continue to use HFC equipment for uh, the whole life cycle of the equipment. We're continuing to allow the import of HFCs, <coughs> we're reducing the quantities eventually, but servicing, there will be um, HFCs available for servicing. Um, I think that you know we're not we're not requiring the retrofit of any equipment. I think the U.S. is in some in some uh, specific end uses, but we're not in Canada. There's also foam products that are used. For example, the appliance foam that's used for insulating walls of a refrigerator and freezer. They're also targeted by our measures. Um, I think, from my understanding, most of the foam pro products in refrigeration appliances have already transitioned to alternative blowing agents. And I think one thing that I forgot to mention or forgot to put on the slide is that we've also built in uh, an exemption. So where there's niche equipment that can't be converted to um, alternatives by the date that we have set out, um, you can apply to Environment Canada for uh, an exemption to the phase to the uh, prohibition on the product-specific regs. So I think that's that's really important. I think there's going to be a few um, niche uses uses that might not where the alternatives might not be suitable. Um, so it's a it's a simple process to apply um, to Environment Canada just to explain why there are no technically and economically feasible alternatives, and we will evaluate the the exemption request. Could you uh, give some examples of such uses? Um, well, one, so one, one example that maybe wouldn't necessarily be an exemption because we've built it into our regulations. We've heard from a number of companies that do cryogenic equipment. So where the temperature is, is, is lower than minus 50 degrees Celsius, they have trouble with uh, the alternatives are maybe not yet there. So in, the, in our product category definitions, we've excluded the cryogenics field. So the products the categories only apply to temperatures higher than minus 50. Um, but, but a niche application like that, where there be a specific reason why the alternative refrigerant won't work. Excuse me, Nancy. Yes. How often is this list being refreshed in the future? Because you just mentioned, for example, uh, non-chillers are not regulated. Yet. Chillers are regulated. Non -chillers. That's the only, it's yes, non so other air conditioning is not regulated, like domestic air conditioning for example is not right. regulated under Right. This. So yeah. that means you know, two years from now, five years from now, hopefully the technology improves and there's an alternative. So. Yes. So I'm curious what your administration is doing or, or what your timeline is like for refreshing that list. So that's an interesting question because as I, uh, the, the way the regulatory process is in Canada, it's usually a very lengthy process. This right now is a government priority. We want to ratify the Kigali Amendment and we want to meet our targets under the, the Paris Agreement. Um, whether, when, to, to normally this would probably take this process to amend regulations would probably <coughs> take three years. So we have a phase down that, that I'm just going to speak to next, that's going to limit the quantities of HFCs that are available in the country to charge equipment, to service equipment over the years. So I think in a certain sense that's also forcing a transition. So whether we need to amend to, to expand the product categories and the prohibitions, um, I'm not sure yet. I mean, I'm certainly, I would certainly like to hear from, from stakeholders and industry as we move forward to see whether or not we do need to, to amend our regulations. At this point, I don't see it happening in the immediate future. Whether in, in four or five years from now um, we amend, I think that's still a question that's open for discussion. <coughs> yes? How do you actually reduce <coughs> the supply of HFCs? By quotas? Yes. By yeah. Yeah. tariffs? Or? By quotas. My quota. So we distribute, we've done, we have information on the companies, the chemical companies that have been importing into Canada over the last uh, nine years. So uh, we are, we will be distributing quotas. It's a system that we had in place for CFCs and for HCFCs, and we're, we're proposing to use the same system for, for HFCs. So we, we gradually reduce the, the quota that's being given to the importing companies. So that forces the price up, right? It's a market-based instrument. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so the phase down, um, yes, yeah. Is the like the alternate technology 
future, is that going to be more efficient, do you think? I think we've seen, I don't know, maybe if Jim will speak to this, I think Jim will speak to this, but we've certainly seen that uh, as, as anything, as the improvements in technology, there's improvements in, in energy efficiency. So it's not just the, the, the refrigerant that's greener, it's the, it's the equipment as well. Okay. Where does the Kigali uh, reference come from, like for Rwanda, uh, did that happen there? Yes, uh, oh, yeah, okay. that's where the meeting of the parties was. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So after I think about a 26 hour negotiating session on the last night, I think it, be, it deserved the honor of having named the Kigali moment. Um, so the phase down. Um, it will apply to companies who are importing bulk HFCs. It's, we're establishing reduction steps from a calculated baseline. The baseline calculation was part of the Kigali Amendment, so all developed countries have the same formula to figure out their, their baseline. And what the baseline represents is the need uh, for refrigerants, a quantity um, that, that represents the need for refrigerants at, at that point in time. Pre-charged equipment coming into Canada does not, is not factored into the phase down, so it, it's targeted by the product specific prohibitions. So our next steps, um, we've received about 50 comments on the proposed amendments that were published in the Canada Gazette Part 1 in November. Um, that might not seem like a lot, but to us it's, it's quite substantial. There's a lot of interest in, in these regulations. We're currently considering um, some of the comments that we received and, and how we can make changes or improvements to the regulations. So I think right now what I've seen is we're going to amend some of the definitions for um, the product categories, adjust GWP limits to allow um, certain alternative refrigerants that are currently being developed, and there might be a couple of adjustments to the timelines, and, and, and actually I think there's a couple of, of sectors where we might actually advance um, the timelines. We're hoping to uh, publish um, by the end of October 2017 in the Canada Gazette Part 2, that would make the regulations final, and then six months uh, following the date of publication, our regulations would enter into force. And that will allow us, the publication in Canada Gazette Part 1, or Part 2, would allow us to ratify uh, the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol. And that, once it enters into force, would create legally binding obligations for Canada. Here's some contact information for those of you who would want more information on uh, what we're doing to <coughs> the Climate Change Canada to uh, address the, the phase down of HFCs. Yes. Hi, uh, do you feel like there'll be a need to phase out the use of HFCs as well, both at the federal level and the local level? Or do you think these consumption uh, quotas will be sufficient to phase down the use and the appropriate amount of time? Yeah, so we didn't we didn't um, take we didn't phase out the use of HCFCs. So even though we, uh, we phased out HCFCs, the use of HCFCs. Sorry, I meant HFCs. That's right. So we're taking the same. So I'm getting there. So okay. we're taking the same approach for for HFCs. So by limiting the consumption, eventually uh, the there won't be any more refrigerant for for these <coughs> equipment um, without having to put controls on the the end use. So, you don't feel provinces will have to amend their regulations? No, I, the, way, the approach we took, there's a national action plan for the protection of, of the ozone layer, and, and the way we approached it um, for CFCs was different. The provinces did phase out the use of CFCs, but the approach for HCFCs, and certainly the approach for HFCs going forward, is more to control the entry of to not only the substance, but of the products coming in. Is this going to be modeled? Like, obviously, they're still going to produce HFCs, and there's going to be growth in the economy, and so the, the amount that gets produced will be dependent upon the growth in the economy, and so on. <clears throat> Has anybody modeled how much the inventory of all that stuff will eventually be by 2036? And ultimately, it seems as if the only place this is really going to go is into the atmosphere. Uh, eventually, when it all leaks out, is that has that happened at some 
scientific level in the world, you know? Yeah, I think uh, I, we have some experts in the, in the room who can probably speak to that a little bit um, more in more detail than I can. But yeah, certainly, I mean, that was part of our, our um, negotiations of the Montreal Protocol. HFCs are the fastest growing, um, presently, are the fastest growing greenhouse, greenhouse gas around the world. And that's partly because um, what, what Tom had explained that in developing countries, there's more and more refrigeration and air conditioning and the cold um, food chain is expanding. So, so yes, we're trying to put these um, measures in place now to stop the growth of these greenhouse gases. Actually, you're right. There were four scenarios, I think, that were developed at the time, and they helped with the uh, negotiation for the right. Yeah. You, you might find it interesting that HFCs right now are 1.2% of the problem, but they would have grown up to 15%. Yeah. So we're catching it early. So the quantity that's out there is not really going to be that significant. And I th one of the benefits of the Montreal Protocol is it's it, the institutions that it has in place. There is a scientific assessment panel, there is an environmental effects assessment panel, there's a number of technical bodies. We have um, one of our refrigeration technical options committees members here in the room with us. So there's a number of scientific advisors that generate reports after reports after reports for the parties to consider and form the basis of our negotiations. So all these controls are based around preventing the import, and you mentioned that we don't produce these chemicals in Canada. That's right. So what's to stop an industrious person from setting up a chemical plant here? Or legislation. Do we have legislation for that already? We have proposed legislation. So in our legislation, even though we do not produce, we have um, prohibited the future production for that reason. So what is the rationale behind exempting pre-charge equipment? The Montreal Protocol doesn't um, control pre-charge equipment. Is it a small percentage of the problem? Why are we ignoring it? Uh, we're not necessarily ignoring it. Our, our legislation has a number of controls. The Montreal Protocol, when it was established in, in, in 1987, decided to take a front-end approach to control um, <coughs> production and consumption oh. of the chemicals, the bulk. Right. And, and that's the approach that the Montreal Protocol. Because they're controlled at the source. Right. They're controlled at the source for the source so yeah. you don't need to do that with and, and some developed countries, like Canada, the US, Japan, the EU, Australia, we've gone a step further to control, to put product specific controls in place. It's, it's over and above what the Montreal Protocol requires us to do. <coughs> Slides, you said you were sticking close to the U.S. in the Canadian actions, given the pension for Mr. Trump and Mr. Bowie. So the, that's that's a good uh, a good point. The the U.S. Um, proposed product specific controls or finalized product specific controls in 2015, and then they did another suite um, of of controls again in 2016. So they're already in place. Um, by all accounts, they will stay in place, but we'll see. Uh, some of the packaged uh, units that you mentioned uh, often require um, replenishment of the uh, refrigerant, like, for example, automobile air conditioning eventually needs replenishment or topping up the uh, refrigerant. It, 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 does the uh, Canadian, do the Canadian regulations uh, prohibit or will they eventually prohibit the topping up of uh, HFC refrigerants in automobiles? No, no. As I, as I mentioned, you can continue to use um, and service equipment uh, for till the end of its useful life. And you know, automobiles... But you may have to go to another country, another country to find the refrigerant. No, I think automobiles, it's a very, um, it's, it's a good um, example because it's, it's just HFC 134A. So, you know, there's a market for recycled and, and reclaimed 134A. So even though we're prohibiting the import of new chemicals, the, you know, it creates an industry of recycled and reclaimed for, for the, some of the substances. So it's, it's just going to be a, a windfall for a scrap car, uh, scrap automobile yards. Or, or even, even worse, if I mean, from personal experience, when R12 was phased out, yeah. uh, personally I know of several service outlets that were hoarding, building up inventory of R12, because mm -hmm. the price was starting to jump. Yeah. They were saying they're going to make a fortune. Mm 
But in fact, the price of one R134 came down rapidly, mm -hmm. and there was no incentive, and they were stuck with skids of R12, and I have no idea what they did. I do Legislation does not um, allow us to. Um, our, our enabling authority is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, um, and, and we haven't um, put financial incentives in place under. But I think, I mean, as, as someone asked before, that there's you know energy efficiency gains in, in new product design. So so maybe that is one of the incentives to, to move away. We'll see. Um, anything more questions? Well, thank you very much, Nancy. <laughs>